Hola, good. My name is Amanda Kilbach. I am the manager of employment and education at the Musevanga Inuit, in, located in Ottawa. Well, we have uh, several programs. Um, we used to have the uh, education support program, and that was funded through the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skill Development, um, and that was targeting Inuit students in the Ottawa area. Um, in post-secondary, so it would range from like 18, 19 to probably early 30s. Yeah, and we would provide um, social events, cultural um, sensitivity training if needed at the post-secondary uh, institutions. Uh, we work with the Indigenous centers in the post-secondary institutions and we provide like country food and and uh, and uh, emotional guidance, I guess. Our aim is to provide the necessary wraparound supports needed for a student to be successful. And it all depends on each person's version of success. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily um, completing a program. There's a lot of circumstances where um, a student may face where they might have to make a choice. And so our programming provides them uh, the toolbox, I guess, of um, whether it's coping mechanisms or, um, or just uh, available options for them to, to make choices um, and hopefully stay in school. We also, like through my other funding pot, which is um, assets, so it's the Aboriginal strategy on skills um, and training, um, we put together like programs. So um, we, we uh, have partnerships with other companies and we, so we provide first aid training, um, forklift training. Uh, we might do a hodgepodge of certifications and then um, like with women is working at heights, food safety. So um, with that, don't, like we, we don't necessarily teach them, but we kind of put the programs together to offer to our clients. Well, it, it, it builds up confidence. These are very short-term um, programs. Uh, we also partner up with iSisters. It's another nonprofit organization, and their mandate is to increase um, the technological skills of women. And so then we partner up with, let's say, ESDC, and so they might come in and do a job fair presentation and um, back in the fall, they hired four of our gra um, graduates from my sisters. And then we did a landscaping program last summer, and uh, we partnered up with Habitat for Humanity. And so they were able to spend a day or two um, building a home and using the skills that they learned in the landscaping program. Uh, when I first started, um, there wasn't as much, I guess, um, in a cultural inclusion in the program. So mm -hmm. we've been trying to uh, incorporate like elders or um, with I sisters um, have an, like a side project within the, that program, whether it's beading or earring making and, and just kind of uh, reconnecting. We always try and offer country food. Um, it's very hard to get, especially um, if you live outside of Inu Nunangat. And so, uh, and country food is in, um, an important part of our culture. So um, just that I sisters, we had like frozen caribou, frozen fish, and it, it was a uh, de delicacy. So it was good. And like country food is soul food to us. So there's uh, other programs at TI that may offer elements. And so being in an urban center, that's all really what we could do is just provide elements. And so our community-wide projects include like apple picking, strawberry picking, um, sugar bush. So it's, it provides an opportunity to be in a more green space. Um, the apple picking and strawberry picking kind of mimics the, the harvesting that we would do back home with berry picking and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do elements and then, um, one of the youth programs, um, they just came back from Bark Lake. And so they, they take a, a, a bunch of teenagers and then they, I don't, I think it's West mm -hmm. and they do some outdoor activities, leadership training. And, um, 
it's not necessarily like the traditional on the land um, programming, but there's elements of it. Those programs that I just mentioned, they're very, very popular. Mm-hmm. And and so um, I think that just kind of illustrates how important it is to, to provide elements of our culture in an urban setting. With assets, um, I mentioned like we've done, um, it's all skills-based training. Mm-hmm. Um, we do resume workshops. Um, we do career cruising workshops. Um, we try and partner up with other employers to come and it's, we call it a job fair, but it's really uh, like an information se- session. And um, anytime a client goes through one of our programs, then they make uh, an appointment with one of our counselors and then they update their resume. Um, we have three locations at TI. So um, our employment counselors will go to other locations. We're pretty in the West End and a lot of our um, clients live in Vanier or in the East End. So um, they'll go on Friday afternoons to our Savart location and, and provide one-on-one kind of um, employment counseling they'll reach. With some of them, signing up for a program is success. Mm-hmm. Um, Completing a program is a success. Um, and sometimes, um, I don't know, like the funder may think like employment is is success, but there's various uh, levels, I think, of success that leads up to employment. Mm-hmm. And so the, the different programs that we do offer at TI, I think, uh, contribute to the different levels of success. So we might start off with a, like a two week program, or even just a one day, like if it's the first aid, um, and then um, we might have repeat clients that will will take the program over and over again. And you can see the confidence being built in them um, after, like let's say, the second completion. Um, and you, we've had clients that in the beginning couldn't finish a program and then they would try it again and maybe by the third time they've completed one of our programs and so for us it's that isn't is a success is that they are able to to complete a a program and one of um one of the um things that we provide also is job start support so um if someone's already uh, employed, then we will help them with anything to kind of keep them employed. And so, if someone hasn't has been out of work for a while, they they will need help with bus transportation, and we'll provide bus passes. And um, if they need specific equipment for the job, like steel toe boots or uh, non slip shoes, we can provide stuff like that. So we're we're trying to create enough wraparound services to help people move into the labor market but that's not necessarily our um, primal outcome Mm -hmm. we just want people to be comfortable to be confident and then when they are ready to go into the labor force then we want to provide them the supports for uh, the um, entry into the labor market to be successful to me hearing um, the people in on the second floor, um, laugh at lunch break, and they're eating country food, and they're they're being um, they're enjoying their space here. When they recommend um, certain programs to their their friends and family, mm-hmm. um, when um, you know the we we uh, communicate our programs on social media, and so uh, you can always tell a popular program with the. We shares and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but for us, I mean, with certain programs, we do get like a hundred percent completion rate, just because. Wow. I mean, they're they're geared for success, so they might be, you know, we might know when to to roll it out or the length of time. Whether you know, sometimes um, program length is also could play a factor in in. Um, completion rates too Mm. so it's just knowing um, our clientele most of our programs will come with a certification of some sort whether it is like WMS or um, uh, working at heights or forklift training Um, with iSisters we do have a higher um, succession in going into like administrative fields Um, and so I think 
um, people see that and, and 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 even though they might um, not realize what their outcome is after the program, I think um, they certainly become more confident and they use our our employment counselors a little bit more after that, like try, then because their interest is peaked entering into the labor force. So with the assets program, um, since I started in this role, we have have had one year extensions. So it's been very hard to kind of um, plan. And then we've also had like influx of money at the very end of, let's say, a fiscal year. So it's very hard to kind of um, be strategic in our programming. What I would like to do is is have like a, a progression. So if it starts with I sisters, then the next step would be something more about um, the receptionist field because the uh, I sisters is just introduction to like Microsoft um, Outlook and Word. And so I wanted to do like a progression, but because of our current financial um, situation, I can't necessarily plan um, how I'd like to plan. And um, currently we're in a 10 year agreement, mm -hmm. um, but the money is still not um, available to TI. We do have an evaluation form at the end. And so um, it asks them about, you know, what they liked about the program. And um, so different aspects. So um, about the location because sometimes it's here sometimes it, it's at another location like you might be at our contractor's um, location or it could be at Sabard or uh, 604 Louis mm -hmm. um, but then we also provide like hospitality right so we always ask about that um, and then we ask about um, questions about um, I guess course content and then at the end we always ask um, what what other um fields or what other programs would they like to see and so um we if when we get more money or if we get more money I, that's something that i would like to develop because we've we've received a lot of feedback about um inuktitut keyboarding and that's something i would love to offer so but um it depends on finances so it's easy to install on our computers and i have it on my computer but it's just it's knowing where the syllabics is because like one letter could be, mean like two or three syllabics so yeah, yeah i think that would be a fun course to offer we are lucky because our current um funder esdc uh since i started we've been able to carry forward whatever money that um that we didn't spend and that's usually because we get an influx of money in let's say february so it, it's unrealistic for us to to develop programs and then um, deliver them by March 31st. So mm -hmm. um, they've been very flexible in terms of letting us um, provide them a timeline of, of how we want to deliver the programs. Um, currently um, in this 10 year strategy, because it's now um, from assets to assets, because it's Aboriginal to Indigenous, <laughs> um, it's uh, distinction based. So all First Nations, there's a First Nation stream, a uh, Métis stream, an Inuit stream, and uh, urban unaffiliated. And currently TI is with the Inuit stream. And so um, it's just navigating through those kind of tables to, to kind of voice that urban Inuit um, require a lot of um, support and financial support and... Um, I think it's close to 40% of um, Inuit or people say, or Inuit reside outside of Inuit Nunungat. Mm -hmm. So they live in urban um, centers or um, in in uh, centers outside of Inuit Nunungat, which is um, Inuvialu region, Nunavut, Nunavik, and uh, Nunatsiavu. So it's just trying to because this is a different approach of, of funding allocation. So um, it's difficult trying to um, communicate to your Northern counterparts um, the, the struggles that um, urban Inuit face. I think it's a spectrum. 
Mm. I think at the very um, least, it should be... Because I went to high school a long time ago, and I didn't even learn anything about our North, about Indigenous peoples. It wasn't until I went to university, and it was a part of my elective. Um, And so I think that it should be part of the curriculum, and it should be from Indigenous perspectives. And now looking back at at what I have learned in high school and university, everything is from the explorer's viewpoint. And there's nothing from, whether it's First Nations, you need, like their viewpoint of when, you know, settlers came or or explorers came. Um, I think that we're at that emerging um, change, I think, in the educational system. Um, There's a Inuit post-secondary school here in Ottawa, Nunavut, Sivunuk Sivun. And um, I've never attended, but they, I have many friends that have, and it's a place where you really get to learn your land claims. You learn about Inuit history. Mm-hmm. They gain so much confidence through performing, um, and I think it's a valuable tool on how to teach, like, because they're really teaching history, but through an Indigenous lens or Inuit lens, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the move towards that would be um, what I would consider indig- Indigenous education. I would love to see, um, like, for for Inuit and the way I view, like, how Inuit learn and in the past is through observation, um, through respect to watching your elders, especially with hunting and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I also recognize that not everyone can learn that way. Um, just like, you know, some people are more visual audio, they they need to write it down. So I, I recognize that not, not every Indigenous person would appreciate Indigenous, Indigenizing education, right? Like, it, mm-hmm. it all depends, right? So it could be like learning in the outdoor space, or it could be, right? Like, or it could be um, talking about um, the biology aspect of when you're harvesting or hunting and um it's a it's a wide spectrum but i think we are at that emerging level of of uh, approaching education in a more kind of multi-dimensional way a lot of uh inuit speak institute i'm not fluent um i i know enough to get around and i understand more than i speak and i think that um, that part is like just confidence um, but it is very important. And, and if you're here on a day where there's programming, then you hear a lot of uh, inuktitut and laughing. And um, so I think it's very important. And we have inuktitut speaking staff here at the employment center. So if anyone requires assistance in inuktitut, then uh, we're able to assist them. Well, I was just at um, a literacy, essential skills and literacy kind of workshop for Indigenous learners and we're uh, just talking about uh, literacy and then I just had to say I'm like you, first of all just to clarify you guys are talking about in English like <laughs> you're not talking about literacy in Indigenous languages which is also very important because you know um, I think people get or some people get trapped into you know it, it they're not completely fluent in English and they're not completely fluent in Inuktitut. So um, it's it's hard and, and and if you're not proficient in one in either, then I think the confidence level goes down. So even if we're providing Inuktitut, let's say um, keyboarding mm-hmm. and in a sense kind of Inuktitut language at the same time, then like even though it's not the working language of Ottawa, I think um, the byproduct of that would be perhaps stronger English skills as well, right? So I think Inuktitut is very important to any program that we offer at TI, and we also have um, the Languages um, Advisor, and we have Inuktitut Word of the Day that gets sent out to everyone because not everyone is, speaks Inuktitut and not everyone here at TI is Inuk. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's also a good reminder because I think it, it even if you do speak Inuktitut, it's a good reminder that we are um, 
placing, you know, importance on Institute in Ottawa. Well, TI is trying to secure um, PSSP, so post-secondary student support mm -hmm. uh, program funding. Um, currently, Inuit students that reside in Ottawa, they have to apply to Mississauga New Credit First Nation and um, to get funding. And um, over many years, TI has been requesting to, uh, to INAC or ISC as Indigenous Services Canada yeah. um, for the transfer of the funds because um, we're an Inuit organization. We are invested in our community and uh, we want our community to succeed and not saying that Mississauga New Credit First Nation doesn't, but we would put more emphasis on outreach and making sure our Inuit students are aware of all the possible uh, funding opportunities. Um, even though I don't have the PSSP funding yet, um, I secured a scholarship for with the C, um, Canadian Federation of University Women, the Canada chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, to my knowledge, it was the first kind of scholarship that was dedicated to uh, an urban Inuk woman. And so, um, and that kind of um, spun off into like, now I have a, a, a listserv for post-secondary Inuit students that are looking for funding and I send them, it's about like, over 50 people from all over and I, I let them know it's up to them to kind of um, determine which scholarship or which funding pot they're eligible for because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's um, it doesn't matter on discipline or region I just send it out um, but I will help and I have helped people with their applications um, I'll send reminders for certain um, scholarships that Mississauga's deadline and Nunavut fans deadline and so um, that's what we're doing. Um, but if and when we get this PSSP, I would love to see an education support officer mm -hmm. where this person would touch base with our, the funded students to keep, um, keep the lines of communi uh, communication open. Um, if there's any kind of uh, academic support that may be needed to help them kind of navigate through just being in a post-secondary institute. Um, you know, um, even though this will be urban Inuit that are accessing this program, um, typically they still come from small communities. Mm -hmm. And so just navigating the whole system. Um, parents... Um, or families that have children in post-secondary um, schooling don't have the history of going to university or post-secondary. So it's also kind of supporting the family in terms of um, kind of what to expect. Um, you know, and it depends on the institution. It's, it might be a little bit more rigid than they're used to or it might be um, hard to navigate if there's no, like, no one's taking attendance in mm. the class, right? Like, it's just navigating all those kind of um, situations that Inuit at post-secondary institutions may face. I want to ideally fund them appropriately. Um, you know, I don't want them to worry about um, how to feed their family. And a, a lot of our students... Um, they might have dependents. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of them might have children before going to post-secondary. And so I want to be able to um, support them and um, fully. It's such a barrier that it would be easy for someone to say, okay, I'm going to, like, I quit. Because it's it's hard to, to see past that hump. Like, it's just, you know, it could be four years of just struggle and then but at the end you're graduated you have a job you can you know like but I don't want it to be such a struggle mm -hmm. I was a uh, a parent too at school so I know the struggle <laughs> even though um it was very first nations based I went to the indigenous center a lot yeah. and I went there to study it was even though it wasn't um, eating meat mm -hmm. um, I still felt some sort of connection like I felt 
like culturally safe. So, and that's another role for the education support officer is to really encourage students to use their Indigenous uh, resource centers at the post-secondary um, institutions because um, you might not see a immediate benefit, but if they have like, computer labs, if there's printing, it's just, it feels culturally safe there. Mm-hmm. Um so anyway, so yeah, I, I used the Indigenous Centre at uh, University of Manitoba quite often. Um, well, I currently sit on a few Indigenous education councils um, at Algonquin, University of Ottawa, um, Queen's University. And so it is um, just slowly providing uh, material. I um, If there's any documents that they create, I edit through an uh, Inuit lens. And I always try and incorporate the Inuit voice in whatever uh, documents that they produce. Um, it could be like providing artifacts. So, you know, we've, we've provided some seal skin, like, uh, and some, like, Inuit art to some of the centers to kind of, um, so if Inuit students do use those centers, they can see kind of themselves in the in- Indigenous um, centers. Every Friday we do, or the cultural program will host at Elders Tea. Oh. Yeah, every uh, Friday afternoon. And then um, I think elders are used, um, their their knowledge is captured in a lot of different aspects of the, of the programming. Mm-hmm. Um, last year, um, our human resources um, contracted uh, an Inuk elder and he did a series of talks on different subjects and so um, that's something that we uh, told our HR that we'd love to see is it's almost not like a TED talk but it's it was very informative and it was very um, organic mm-hmm. yeah it's really interesting